Hi, good evening and welcome to Community Homeworks Workshop this evening. My name is Jason Byler. I am the Education Manager here at Community Homeworks. We're glad you're joining us. Tonight's workshop is a pre-recorded workshop from last year. We are showing some of our favorite workshops this month while we take a brief break um, and, a, and an intentional and strategic pause to sharpen our axe as an organization and as a team. For this month of May, we are not accepting new applications and we are not doing any live workshops, but we will be back in June of 2022 with new live workshops and we will accept applications again at that point. So we look forward to seeing you then. If you have questions during tonight's workshop, please put them down in the comment section. Uh, we might not be able to answer them in real time, but we will get back to you as soon as we can with those questions and answers. We've got some great shows coming up and we've got lots more planned for next month. Thank you for joining us tonight and please comment to let us know if you have questions. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Community Homeworks, tonight's virtual workshop. We're glad you're joining us. Um, our workshop tonight is one that I'm very excited about because it's a workshop I've been planning for about three or four months. Um, and it's something that is very, very important, especially during this time when we're spending so much time in our homes. Um, my name is Jason Byler. I am the education manager at Community Homeworks. Um, and I get to be introducing tonight's workshop. Jean, who normally introduces the workshops, is off tonight and um, doing some other fun stuff. So um, you get to put up with me tonight, as well as our as our guest. Um, Community Homeworks is a nonprofit home repair and maintenance organization here in Kalamazoo. We have a mission to empower low-income homeowners to maintain safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. Um, Part of that is through our educational workshops, which up until the pandemic were in person doing hands-on uh, workshops. Um, the other part is our critical home repair program where we uh, help people who have critical needs in their home, usually related to health or safety. And we try to help them either through our own team or through other, um, other organizations and other resources in our community. So those are very important for us. Tonight's workshop, we're, we have titled Indoor Air Quality. Uh, we're talking a lot about how the quality of our air in our homes affects our health and how um, having different things in our home and different health issues can affect, um, can be affected by our indoor air quality. So. Um, we have a very special guest tonight. Michael Pinto is with us. Michael is the CEO of an organization or a company in Kalamazoo called Wonder Makers. And Wonder Makers works with helping folks to address air quality issues in their home, in their business, other places like that. Uh, we do have a video that Michael uh, provided to us and we're going to be showing that video. You may comment along the way. Feel free to leave comments in the box below. And at the end of the presentation, we will bring in Michael or uh, Jacob, who also works with Michael, to answer some of those questions. Um, but we would love to have your comments and your questions as we go along. Once again, thank you for joining us. Please comment. Um, and we're going to move right into the video with Michael Pinto. So thank you again, Michael, and thank you everyone for joining us. Hello, it is an exciting time for us here at Wondermakers because we've been waiting to get this information out to you at Community Homeworks. I'm Michael Pinto, I'm the Chief Executive Officer over here at Wondermakers, and you can see from the slide that uh, we've been in the Kalamazoo area for over 30 years. 1988 is when we started and we are experts in the whole area of indoor contaminants. So we're going to talk today about indoor air quality. What exactly does that mean and why are we here to share this information with you? 
The reality of the situation is that the EPA has done a number of studies, has been confirmed by other folks, and in general, people spend about 90% of their time indoors. Now that includes your home, uh, workplace, your vehicles, things like that, but you're inside of uh, some uh, contained area. And in this particular case, the air quality in those areas makes a difference to your health. Now, a couple of things have impacted us. The latest is the COVID pandemic. That's forced more people to spend more time in their homes. And, uh, you know, that's to help with the uh, control of the spread of the virus. But regardless, it means that people are in their homes. And if there's problems in the homes, that's more problems for them. So when we talk about indoor air quality, the important thing to realize is that good air quality uh, makes a difference in terms of how you feel. Bad air quality, of course, uh, can lead to all sorts of problems. Some of the things that they talk about here, eyes and skin and nose and throat irritation, upper airway uh, congestion, dizziness, fatigue, there's even worse symptoms depending on what sort of contaminants in there. They can be long-term brain damage from lead exposure, for example. There can be immediate neurological problems from ex uh, mercury exposure from some of the older bulbs and things uh, like we are seeing here in the uh, classroom here at Wondermakers, although these are newer fixtures with uh, mercury-free bulbs. But um, some of the problems uh, really is the fact that you uh, can be exposed to bad air and uh, carbon monoxide, for example, can kill you uh, within a few minutes if you allow that to build up because you have a car running in the garage next to you and things. Now, I don't expect you to read this because the uh, type is really, really small, but the EPA also pointed out that there's a number of people that are more susceptible to bad indoor air quality than others. Uh, the elderly and hay fever sufferers and young children and people who are asthmatic and bronchitis and newborns and individuals that have emphysema. And now there's some linkage. Uh, even people who have Alzheimer's and stuff are going to be more susceptible to poor indoor air quality. So if the potential for bad air in a home is so important, uh, where's these problems coming from? Uh, the little graphic here helps to understand some of them. Uh, volatile organic compounds from chemicals and paints and mold and bacteria. Animal dander. Uh, outdoor air pollutants that get in if the house isn't uh, uh, fully sealed or properly sealed. Uh, gases from uh, combustion appliances like fireplaces and gas stoves, chemicals coming through the uh, groundwater and just the soil gases coming through the foundation. Those are all sources. Uh, now there's personal sources as well, how we live in our house and what chemicals we use in our house and health and beauty aids and fuels and all sorts of things. Uh, even hobbies, if you're a painter or uh, something like that with art supplies can be uh, difficult on the indoor air in your home. A couple more things to think about. Again, I know you can't read the uh, details potentially, but uh, dust and dust mites and furniture, upholstered furniture, off-gaffing formaldehyde and insulation in your home, that's old style insulation that might still be off-gassing. The attached garage like we talked about, even the laundry uh, in terms of if it's not vented properly, putting too much moisture if you're drying the clothes or even uh, washing the clothes, showers, no vents in the bathroom or not turning the vents on can cause problems as well. Just all all sorts of things that impact the air quality to the point where it's difficult sometimes for us to even keep all this in our head. So the simplest way for me to talk about indoor air quality is to ask a simple question. Do you feel better when you're in the building or in the car or better when you're out of it? And if the answer is that you feel better when you're away from your home or you're away from your vehicle or you're away from your workplace, then the likelihood is that there's some indoor air quality issues going on in that space. And that's what we're here to talk about. Now, the first thing I will say is that when you talk about indoor air quality, it's just please be aware there is a ton of bad advice 
that's out there about how to deal with the indoor air quality. Let me just show you a couple of them here on the slide and explain what we're talking about. But believe me, the amount of bad advice uh, per probably uh, greatly exceeds the amount of good advice that's out there. I know everybody loves the internet and it's great information that's out there and things, but it is sometimes difficult to actually sort through and find out what is uh, legitimate information and what is not. So uh, just a couple of things that, uh, from an indoor air quality perspective, if you've got bad indoor air quality, one of the worst things you can do is use some sort of uh, spray to kind of cover it up. Oh, we're going to use a, um, uh, something that smells like mountain fresh or uh, pine forest or whatever it is. That's not taking care of the indoor air quality problem. That's just trying to mask it, that's hiding it. And more importantly, you're actually adding more contaminants to your environment. Um, people say, well, just do more cleaning, just do more vacuuming, vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. Well, uh, if there's uh, contaminant problems in the carpet, for example, vacuuming without a special vacuum that has a HEPA filter, that's high efficiency particulate air, is actually just going to push more of that into the airstream and make the indoor air quality worse rather than better. It might get the visible lint and chunks off of the carpet, but potentially it's going to take a lot more of the very small microscopic particles and push them into the air. Uh, this uh, picture here is somebody vacuuming off their uh, furnace filter and then they're going to put it back in. That is a bad idea. Uh, generally, the furnace filters are, are uh, replaceable. They're des uh, designed to be disposable. And when you take a vacuum to it like that, yes, you may be getting off a lot of the dirt, the dust that's on there, but you're doing two things. You're damaging the structure of the fibers that's on the filter, and you're actually pushing some of the debris through to the other side of the filter so that when the furnace comes on, it's going to push more debris uh, down your ductwork than if you had just uh, taken the filter out and let it run without the filter at all. The thing is to just replace those filters on the design schedule, which is usually monthly. Some of the thicker ones are designed to go quarterly or twice a year, and sometimes uh, some of the big ones might actually go uh, for a whole year. But just follow the manufacturer's recommendations. And then last but not least, uh, I didn't even make it very big. There's so many uh, quick fixes for indoor air quality. We're going to take a UV bulb and we're going to install it in your furnace. We're going to take uh, a light fixture and put it up. We're going to put an uh, air purifier in that's got hydroxyl radicals or ozone or something. And, and if it sounds too good to be true to fix the problem, it probably is. And unfortunately, many times it's dangerous as well. So... Uh, of all of those, I said a moment ago, my favorite pet peeve is the air purifiers, air cleaners. There's one sure way to clean your air. Remove the source of the materials that's contaminating the air in the first place. And even though some of these uh, run with filters to uh, be air purifiers and stuff, the reality is if you're not controlling the source the air purifiers will never catch up. So, uh, with all the things that can cause problems, how do we ever sort out just exactly what's going on with indoor air quality? Well, we categorize them in major uh, classifications. And this is what we're going to spend the rest of the time in this little uh, educational session talking about. Uh, we'll start with just a couple of slides on each of these. Ventilation and pressurization, uh, superior sanitization, that just means cleaning well, uh, moisture management, control of the chemicals that are in your house, and then actually spending a little bit of time about some very specific contaminants that tend to pop up in older houses that can cause you problems. And so we're going to uh, talk specifically about asbestos lead, mercury, and radon. Uh, toward the end of this session, all right? So let's get at it. Let's talk about ventilation and pressurization. Probably the best thing you can do in your house to control moisture and control odors um, is to have appropriate ventilation to the out of doors. So that would include ventilation in bathrooms, for example, and in the laundry room, uh, certainly hood vents and things that we're using in the kitchen to get the air out. Now, uh, it also turns out that some of these 
air exhaust vents, depending on which side of the house they're on, how far up they are, whether they have caps on them and things like that, can indeed be sources of air coming from the outside into the house. So even though these are supposed to be exhaust vents here, um, because of the way it's set up on this particular diagram, it's forcing air into the house and into some of those living areas, which may or may not be a good thing. It depends on the pressurization in your house and how that's set up and whether that's a design function or not. But if they're supposed to be exhaust and they're bringing in air, that's not good and vice versa. We talked about filters and filter maintenance just a moment ago where we saw the picture of that person vacuuming off the filter. Um, Basically, most homes have um, furnaces and what they call HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems that are designed to have replaceable filters, as you can see on the picture here. Um, and there's a whole raft of them. It's not just 3M that makes them. There's other sorts of folks. Uh, you can get them designed specifically to control odors or dust, um, allergens, that sort of thing. What you don't want to do is let them get so jammed up that they actually create a back pressure and end up uh, forcing the air to rip the filters like you see in that particular picture there. So if they're designed to be changed on a monthly basis, change them on a monthly basis. Put it on your calendar. Uh, put it on your phone calendar so that there's a reminder to change out those filters. Usually they're anywhere from two to about seven dollars uh, depending on what sort of filter it is that you're doing. Um, when we talk about Superior sanitization, that's just a alliteration to use. That's rhyming words to help you remember. We really need to clean well. And cleaning well means getting the small particles, the microscopic particles. Here's a size comparison of some of the different uh, particulates that uh, sometimes are referred to as the enemy of indoor air quality or good indoor air quality. Uh, mold and spores, pollen, uh, soot, uh, just general dust particles, including skin cells and stuff, all of that compared to a human hair. And the bigger the particles, the easier it is for your respiratory system to trap them before they get deep into your lungs. That's why we have hair in our nose, That's uh, and hopefully none sticking out for this video or anything, but that's why we have hair in our nose. We actually have little hairs called cilia on the inside of our throat that um, has the sputum on it that captures a lot of the dust particles. But if they're really tiny, uh, smaller than this 2.5 microns right in this area, it's really difficult for our body systems to capture that. So a lot more ends up going down into our lungs. And if that's a mold spore, a lead particle, uh, soot or something like that that contains a carcinogen, that's just not gonna be good for you. And indeed, it may have long-term effects as well as short-term effects. Now, one of the ways that we can clean better, and you've probably seen these by the trade names, Swiffer and the generic names and that sort of stuff. Um, that was actually quite an advancement in the cleaning industry when those came out and became available to the public because they're microfiber claws. And you don't necessarily want to use a Swiffer to pick up uh, you know, stuff that can be picked up with a broom or a standard vacuum or something, but when you're ready to do that final cleaning, uh, countertops or floors, hard floors, uh, and you can use a Swiffer or some uh, version of that that's a microfiber cloth, you're gonna pick up a lot more of the microscopic particles in that final cleaning. And, and this is how the fibers are laid out, and you can see how on the microscopic basis how much better it's gonna be at picking up the small particles than the standard uh, cotton fiber or synthetic fiber that just basically at that point when it's down to the microscopic uh, particles, they're pushing them around rather than doing anything with them. All right. Uh, as far as cleaning goes, don't forget your upholstered furniture. Uh, yes, using a vacuum on them occasionally, but uh, actually having a uh, hot water extraction or what they call the steam cleaning, uh, whether it's um, uh, do it yourself or, or by a professional who comes in to do the carpet cleaning on occasion, uh, that would be a good thing. Think about not only having the carpets cleaned on an annual basis by a professional, but uh, some of the upholstered furniture as well. If you do have a, a professional carpet cleaner, we would recommend one that uses what they call a truck mount system. That's a van or a truck. It's got a much more powerful suction motor. Uh, 
uh, generally provides a lot hotter water than the uh, small systems you can rent from the hardware store or even from the grocery stores um, uh, and then fill with your own water and soap and that sort of stuff. Those generally leave the carpet and the upholstery too wet and unless you're doing that in the middle of the winter when it's really dry in the house, uh, uh, it's probably not going to dry properly and then you run the risk of having mold in your carpets and in your upholstered furniture and that's going to be an even bigger mess than what you started. And that is true, quite honestly, of a lot of indoor air quality fixes. There's things that you can do yourself if you think it through and do it well and there's other things that if you try and do it yourself, you're just going to make the situation worse. Um, as far as cleaning goes, what about cleaning the air, using the air purifiers? I would say, yeah, I mean, they can be useful. Uh, I like filters on the furnace and things as a first step. I like uh, cleaning procedures in the house to minimize a lot of dust, but uh, sometimes older houses, I mean, you're just leaking air from the attic and you've got blown in cellulose insulation. I mean, you're just going to have a lot of dust in the house on a general basis. And that, in that case, room air purifiers, particularly in the bedroom, can be really, really helpful. Uh, but you don't need a real fancy one. I mean, some of these things run six and seven and eight hundred dollars. Uh, what you need is a small blower and a fan that's pushing air through a HEPA filter, H-E-P-A, uh, high efficiency particulate air, and uh, you know, simple ones like Holmes or Panasonic's that you can get at Target or Myers or uh, you know any of the uh, Menards, Lowe's, anything like that. Uh, probably going to run anywhere from 40 to about $120, depending on the size and the type of filters. Um, unless you have a lot of odors in the house, uh, forget uh, carbon filters and forget uh, UV lights and blue lights and all these other add-on things that they put on. You just want to filter the air and get the small particles out. You'll breathe better. You'll sleep better. Uh, it'll be a better deal for you. So uh, basically the inexpensive... Uh, value-laden HEPA filtered air purifiers are the ones that you want if you need an air purifier. All right, moving from cleaning to moisture management, uh, there's really two sources of moisture in a house. Uh, and first of all, let me point out, the, the water or moisture that's in this house should only be there because you want it to be there. It generally should come in through your water pipes and be used for something and then go out through the drain. If it's anything other than that, it's probably going to be a problem, and those problems are then going to lead to a number of uh, indoor air quality issues that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But before we get there, I want to talk about the two sources of uh, moisture uh, that gets into a house are stuff that comes in inadvertently, that's through the leaks and stuff, and then things that we do inside the house through our living habits that cause problems. From a leak standpoint, these are the some of the biggest um, uh, factors in a home for water management, um, uh, ridge vents that aren't put on properly, um, chimney caps and flashing, damaged shingles, ice dams around the eaves trough, um, water coming down the eaves troughs and building up on the side of the house, getting in from the foundation, particularly when you've got dirt build up around the foundation so that the water, instead of running away from the house, tips back toward it and things like that. Um, coming in through sill plates or bad siding, going in through electrical and plumbing uh, connections that are coming through to the outside. If you have a hose spigot and thing, that has to go back to the inside of your house. And so if that's not caulked around it, uh, that's going to cause a problem. And then just cracks and foundation and sump pumps and things like that, uh, allowing moisture to get up into the home. So once you have that and you understand that there's water that gets into the house from the outside coming in, you also have to be aware of the moisture that you put into the house yourself, uh, taking showers without using a vent in the bathroom, uh, cooking without turning on the hood vent, uh, uh, drying clothes in the wintertime and having one of those connections that's on the dryer that allows you to divert the air into your basement or into your laundry room. That sounds like a great idea. Oh, the house is too dry, so we're going to put humidity in. We're taking humidity from the wash clothes, and we'll just put that into the house. But it's too much in one location. So you're essentially, it's like um, uh, trying to water your plants in an entire garden by turning on the hose and leaving it at one spot. 
you're going to drown the one plant and you're not going to get the water to the rest of your plants. That's what you're doing to your house, essentially, with those uh, diverters on your um, clothes dryers. You're drowning that area right in your laundry room and it's not diffusing throughout the rest of the house very well. You're going to cause some real problems. All right, as far as the bigger problems related to moisture in your house, if you're allowing leaks to go unattended or if you're creating problems, like I said, with the showers or the cookings, not venting the air properly, things like that, um, basically you're going to support some form of biological growth. Um, when it first gets wet around the condensation on the windows and stuff, you're going to have to worry about bacteria and other sorts of microorganisms growing. Then it's going to be the mold growth, and then that's going to attract insects, and then the insects are going to attract vermin. That's going to be little mice and spiders and um, pigeons and all sorts of stuff. You know what? It's just like people. All of these organisms need water to survive. And if you're providing it in your house in a quiet corner of the uh, sink cabinet underneath the, uh, you know, the cabinet underneath the sink hidden by some cleaning chemicals and stuff, the mice are going to find it. And uh, once the mice find it, then you're going to have uh, bigger problems uh, with that. So uh, like the little illustration shows here, what mold needs is a food source and the right temperature and the spores. All of those are going to be available in your house. There's no way you can keep uh, the spores from the outside from getting into your house. So really the controllable factor is the moisture. We control the moisture and then we don't have mold that grows like that in our house. If we do have mold, it can cause health problems. Uh, people that have existing health symptoms we talked about in regards to general indoor air quality, those are also going to be the ones that are more susceptible to the mold growth. So you're going to see the elderly, you're going to see the infants, you're going to see people with allergies and immune system issues all being more susceptible to mold. Um, the interesting thing about the mold is that you can have multiple people in the house and two or three can say, I don't feel anything, and one can be uh, seriously sickened by it. So if you see visible mold, you want to make sure that we're dealing with that. Or if you have people that are experiencing allergy symptoms when they come in the house, a good uh, indicator is that there may be some mold there. So um, you know, just be careful if you see things like that. Uh, the, the reality is that there are some do-it-yourself uh, fixes for mold, but I, you know, as an expert in this field, I would just tell you, it, once it gets a, to be a bigger problem, if you don't catch it early and it, it gets to be a bigger problem, then it's probably time to bring a professional in. A couple of rules of thumb that I would use, less than six square feet of mold uh, on non-pore surfaces or painted surfaces, again, condensation on uh, painted walls or uh, block walls down in the basement and stuff like that. Those are the sorts of things that you might be able to handle. Uh, if you do decide to uh, take on a small mold project and clean it up by yourself, uh, some mold around the... Um, uh, grout lines in your showers and uh, around your bathtub and uh, things like that. You can certainly handle that. But I would stay away from the home remedies. Uh, you know, people talk about rubbing alcohol and hydrogen peroxide and bleach is just awful, by the way. Um, and if you do have some visible mold growing somewhere, uh, try and go with one of the commercial products. You can find a whole bunch of mold killers and stuff. One of the safer ones that does a good job, and I'm not a paid salesman for anybody that you see on any of the slides here, just uh, you know, products that I know that work pretty well. The Concrobium ones, uh, you can find those at the hardware store and stuff. Uh, those are a salt-based solution. So they're very safe for the people that are using them, but they're very effective against the mold. So just a, a suggestion for you there. If it gets bigger, like we see up in the attic here, uh, with all of this, now people might call that mildew because it looks white, but no, that's, that's a form of mold. Um, or anything behind the wallpaper, this was actually a flooded house, and so uh, you know, it didn't get dried out properly quick enough, and you end up with all that sort of mold. That's all professional work, from my opinion. Uh, too many people try and do it yourself with mold and they end up making the situation worse because they spread it around. They don't have isolation and uh, the right tools, things like that. In an attic, 
this individual is actually using a dry ice blaster uh, to take care of it in the attic. All right, so we've talked about ventilation and pressurization. We've talked a little bit about uh, moisture control uh, and the mold and everything. We've talked about superior sanitization, and now that's bringing us to the next item on our list, which is chemical control. And the fact of the matter is we all have chemicals in our house that are off-gassing and potentially contributing to a bad um, situation in regards to the indoor air quality. And typically you're going to see those in different uh, configurations. The health and beauty aids, for example, uh, you've got bottles of alcohol around a lot of times or alcohol-based products. And if you happen to leave those open, that will uh, vaporize into the air and that can cause uh, uh, irritation uh, for people. Um, you certainly have the... Uh, you know, pesticides and the paint thinners and all of the maintenance chemicals and oils and that sort of thing. If you've got a garage or a little uh, shop area down in the basement or something like that, and anything that's down there should be properly capped and covered so that they're uh, not causing uh, problems anywhere. Um, out in the garage, it's oftentimes uh, people uh, holding on to barbecue type stuff and the fuels and the starters, and then even the um, fuels and the oils and things as we can see up there in the paints, all of that can contribute to the indoor air quality. So from a chemical control standpoint, what's the big issue? And I would just say purge it. The rule of thumb at the Pinto household is if we haven't used it in a year and it's a liquid or a solid chemical, particularly one that could off gas, um, you know, throw it out. Now, when we talk about throwing it out, however, we have to be careful with this because a lot of these chemicals, if they can off gas and cause indoor air quality problems, means they can also be bad for the environment. And so you want to make sure that you're taking it to the um, household hazardous waste program. Uh, the great thing is that here in Kalamazoo County, we've got a very good and efficient program. And as long as you live within the county, you take it over to the uh, drop-off site by the Kalamazoo County Fairgrounds, and um, I, I think it's most days, but you can look up online or you can call them, find out when they're open. But it's most days, like on uh, business, um, and just put everything in a box uh, that you haven't used for a while, including cleaning products and pesticides and fuels or whatever. Uh, they'll even take asbestos from your home if you properly uh, package it, if you uh, find some items when we get to that in a few minutes. And you just take that and drop it off at the household houses waste and they'll say thank you and they'll help you get it out of your car and they'll sort it out. Some of it can be reused or recycled. Other parts they have to just dispose of properly. So it's not getting into the groundwater, not polluting the soil, uh, things like that. That's going to be very important with chemicals. All right, the last main section, we're going to subdivide this into uh, four different ones here. It's just recognizing hazards. Um, we're going to specifically talk about the asbestos, the lead, the mercury, and the radon. Silica is in there, but that's only if you're really doing a lot of construction on your drywall and bricks and stuff. So uh, in the effort of, of uh, uh, timing here, we're going to go after these uh, four. So let's start with the asbestos. And uh, the first question, a lot of people really don't know what asbestos is. And the asbestos and the lead are both minerals that we dig up from the ground. They have different uh, impacts on us from a health standpoint. Uh, the nice thing about uh, asbestos, it was very, um, uh, commercially, it was a very important product for us because the fibers were non-combustible, uh, chemical resistant, and things like that. The fact of the matter is we know of we, meaning the industry, knows of at least 3,000 products that were made at different points in time that had asbestos in them. And you can see the list here. Uh, wicks and filtering material and gaskets and fume hoods and floor tile, which is the big one that we're going to talk about, and window putty in the older houses. Um, but the electrical wiring and the cable trays and the circuit breakers and a lot of the textured plaster all of those can contain asbestos, and if you're going to disturb any of that as you're remodeling your house or as you're doing some improvement or is there some uh, leak that you have to take care of, you just have to be aware of that. So 
not only does the asbestos um, very useful in terms of the fibers and everything, it turns out the fibers continue to break down into smaller and smaller fibers. And remember what I was telling you uh, a few slides ago about how the smallest dust particles get past our nose hair and our uh, throat uh, cilia and all that and deep into our lungs? Well, the um, smallest microscopic asbestos particles are going to be smaller than that 2.5 microns, and that means they're going to go deep into the lungs as well, and there they're going to damage the lung structure. That's just a um, picture from underneath a microscope of the asbestos fibers. So what does that mean for us in terms of protecting ourselves and uh, not creating an indoor air quality problem in our homes from an asbestos standpoint. Well, the first thing is to know if you've got like nine by nine floor tiles, um, not to do a lot of power vacuuming or sanding or, or buffing or anything like that uh, because that will literally strip the wax off and then get into the tiles and start pushing the fibers into the air. But if you know it's an asbestos-containing ceiling, uh, asbestos-containing wiring, asbestos-containing caulk, uh, whatever it might be, no dry sweeping, no regular vacuums, just like you can get uh, HEPA filters for the air purifiers, some of the vacuums have to have HEPA filters in them, no dry stripping, and then if you're going to clean things, we always use uh, some sort of water to control it, so we wet mop, we wet buff uh, tiles and things like that. All right, uh, and I know that this is uh, just real quick on these, and if you have any questions about this stuff, feel free to call us at Wondermakers. We're happy to answer questions from the members of the community, and uh, you know, there's no charge for an initial consultation or just a quick question. Just happy to get you started. Uh, jumping from the asbestos to the lead, similar in that it's a mineral that's uh, found in the earth, and we found all sorts of wonderful products to make out of it but not so similar from the standpoint, instead of breaking into uh, particles, it breaks down into small, um, or I mean fibers, it breaks down into small particles. Um, lead is absolutely poisonous because the particles actually get absorbed into the bloodstream. It's considered a poison as compared to the asbestos fibers, which uh, primarily damage the respiratory system. The lead contamination in your home, uh, the, the picture is quite um, uh, descriptive here. Uh, the paint uh, before 1978 contained a lot of lead, so if you've got peeling or just damaged paint in your house, and you don't even notice the damage a lot of time. If you've got uh, windows that go up and down and the sashes and stuff, that whole area where the windows uh, are moving up and down, that's considered to be a friction point. And a lot of times you'll see a lot of dust inside the window troughs and things, and that is uh, going to be a hazard if it's a lead-containing paint. Uh, pottery, um, hobbies, um, a lot of people bring lead dust home from the work that they do. And uh, one that isn't as um, uh, well understood uh, by a lot of people is that uh, a lot of the spices in the foods, particularly now that you can buy online from overseas sources uh, without necessarily coming through a standard uh, you know, customs area or something like that, uh, can actually contain lead, and so now you're ingesting it. Uh, older pottery, uh, by the way, particularly a lot of the Mexican cookware and stuff had lead in the paints, and then as you serve your food in it, that lead actually gets absorbed into the food, and then you um, ingest that, and that can be a problem. So I know it's not really indoor air quality until the dust breaks down and get into the air, but the lead poisoning uh, is hard to determine whether it's coming from the air or from the surfaces, and the reality is that it's a combination of both. Uh, a couple of slides back, I mentioned that lead was in the plastic too, old uh, plastic, um, plastic blinds uh, that are in your home and stuff uh, where you're uh, dusting those. That can actually uh, uh, deposit a lot of lead into the air and onto your skin, which then gets into your uh, body and everything. A lot of the old electrical cords, this is a lead check swab. And it immediately can tell you whether there's lead in a, a dust on the surface. And this was just a computer cord that we had here at Wondermakers from a few years ago. And uh, out of curiosity, tested that. And sure enough, that was a lead-containing plastic. I thought it important enough to control the lead by understanding where it may be in your house. 
to uh, talk just for a few minutes about these lead check swabs because they do allow you to uh, test on site. So um, you score the surface, you activate the swab, uh, you're gonna swab the liquid onto a scratched surface or, or some uh, sort of uh, uh, surface that you're suspect about. And then you're gonna observe a color change and if it's red, it's lead. And I'm gonna walk you through those very quickly. Uh, each of these lead check swabs that you can buy in the store, and again, we don't have any financial connection to these people. We're not trying to tell you to use these just because it's somehow gonna benefit wonder makers. It's just to help you. Um, but each of those lead check swabs have a little cardboard sleeve on them and inside the sleeve, there's two ampules. One has a powder and one has a liquid. Uh, to get ready, you have to, if it's a paint surface, you find a damaged area, or you might actually have to cut through it when we're doing lead inspections. We take a clean razor knife and we just cut a little score mark like that. Um, make sure the swab looks good. If you look close at it, it actually tells you in two different locations where you're supposed to press to crush those ampules inside. Uh, the glass is inside a plastic sleeve that's inside a cardboard sleeve, so you don't have to worry about cutting yourself or anything like that. It just allows those uh, materials to mix. You push those two and shake it. And then you should get some kind of golden colored liquid that's coming out the tip there. You take that and you rub it on the surface and uh, rub it back and forth. Again, um, a little bit longer than what most people think. Uh, 30 seconds if you're not watching your watch or something uh, can seem like a long time, but that's about the amount of time it takes some of the uh, lower concentrations of lead to activate. And then uh, remember the difference from that gold color, now all of a sudden that's red. Oops, that is a lead-based paint. And the concentration of lead, you can actually tell, um, depending on how purplish red it goes from here all the way down to the light colors here, um, you can see that you can actually get some indication as to just how much lead is in those system or in those uh, products. Now the question is, um, in most cases, lead paint abatement, if you've got peeling lead paint or damaged lead paint in your house, that's not a do-it-yourself sort of scenario. Uh, if you're trying to do it yourself here, um, you think you might be keeping it under control, but there's all sorts of uh, documented cases where homeowners have poisoned themselves and their entire family by trying to take care of the lead-based paint themselves rather than bringing professionals in who have the HEPA vacuums and the suits and stuff. And unfortunately, this is a uh, x-ray from a child that had um, the lead that accumulated in the joints of their knee um, because of the exposure from the homeowner who is trying to do a do-it-yourself uh, after they had determined that there might be some lead in the air and things like that. All right, let's just finish up with the uh, mercury and the radon here. Uh, the mercury is found in a lot of different areas. Uh, the old mercury um, the fluorescent lights, uh, but also mercury vapor lights, um, thermometers, thermostats, batteries, old blood pressure cuffs uh, that has, you know, that you'd pump up and literally had the mercury uh, inside there. Uh, inside these uh, round old thermostats, there's these, uh, what they call the glass ampules that actually have the mercury in them. So if you're changing a the thermostat, be careful with that. It's not gonna hurt it to take it off, but that thermostat should actually be turned into the household hazardous waste program, and they'll separate that mercury out so it doesn't get back uh, into the environment. Uh, Radon is uh, pretty easy, well, it's uh, odorless, tasteless gas, so you don't know if it's coming into your home, uh, but if your home has a basement in the Kalamazoo area, it's a pretty good chance, at least two out of three, that you're gonna have radon because of the area that we're in, the soil subset and everything, and the fact that the radon uh, comes up through the um, sandy soils easier than the clay soils and stuff. And the good news is testing for whether you've got radon in your house is pretty easy and pretty inexpensive. You go to the hardware store or the grocery store, uh, look for a radon test kit, and uh, it's a little canister. You'll take the top off, you'll set it out, uh, record the date and time that you start the test, cover it back up, send it into the laboratory, and you'll get a report within a day or so that tells you what sort of radon levels you have in your house. And they're very good at explaining whether they're okay levels or dangerous or whatever. 
if you need to do something about it, unfortunately, it is going to be um, something that you're going to have to get a contractor in. And in Michigan and most other states, they have to be licensed as radon uh, you know, reduction contractors and stuff. So uh, if you ever run into that situation and you need a good contractor, call us at Wondermakers. We are not contractors here. We're consultants. But we work with a lot of contractors in all these different areas, asbestos abatement contractors, lead contractors, radon contractors. And all of that uh, is, uh, you know, gives us an opportunity to find out which ones are the best. And then we can uh, recommend different uh, folks to you if you need something. But on the radon side, they're going to have to install a situation like this. It's a subsoil depressurization. Isn't that sound fancy? Subsoil depressurization. And um, uh, what they're going to do is extract the air from underneath your house before it gets into the basement and bring it up through a fan and out uh, through the side of the house or out through the roof of your house. Um, but that's uh, going to be something that a professional has to engineer and install in your home. Whew. A lot of different uh, indoor air quality issues that we covered in a very short time. Uh, let me just finish this segment of the program by saying, uh, again, we're here at Wondermakers. Uh, the number is 382-4154. Please call us if you have any questions. We're happy to help with um, you know members of the community and just give you our best guidance possible uh, with that we're now going to jump to uh, a couple of uh, short segments uh, just taking some of this information and showing what goes on in terms of how you can help improve the indoor air quality in your house by going out and looking at a house and seeing some of the things that can be done as we discussed indoor air quality in terms of residences as well as commercial buildings really starts on the outside. If you have water or other sorts of intrusions of gases or smoke or exhaust, that's gonna eventually make its way inside. So one of the things that we wanna be focused on in terms of residential indoor air quality, probably the biggest thing that we see at uh, Wondermakers is the water infiltration, then the water gets into the house and that leads to bacterial growth and mold and mildew and all sorts of things. So in this particular house, you can see they have this planter system here in front. And when we go inside, you'll see what it was doing to the interior walls. But it was clearly a moisture source with the limestone and everything here. Uh, and so what had to happen is that all of the uh, plantings had to come out at one point in time. Uh, these uh, metal planter boxes were built up to fit inside there, but what's most important is if you see behind here, this is what they call a termination bar. So this is a piece of metal, and then down below there you can see the black. That is the thick rubberized membrane. So they lined the entire uh, a planter box here with that, brought it up, put a termination bar there. Uh, you can see it just a little bit here, but in the summertime, when there's some things that are filling in, uh, you don't see anything. But that stopped the water from going down toward the side of the house and then uh, right down through the soil and then into the basement where it was migrating through the wall and then creating uh, all sorts of problems, mold and and uh, all sorts of other things. Now, one of the best ways to stop water infiltration on the side of a house, you saw the rubberized membrane and the termination bars and stuff, but if you don't want to do all the digging on the side of the house, there's a system where they inject bentonite clay. It's just uh, uh, pipes like this, and they'll actually put it right down uh, through the inside here. So this water faucet was an area where they had uh, quite a bit of uh, leakage into the house and this is one of the areas and you can see just a little bit of the residue here of the uh, bentonite clay but they come along about every 8 to 12 inches and insert the rods and then hydraulically push this bentonite clay in it fills in against the wall and then it's the most amazing material as more water hits it, it actually becomes more waterproof. So within a few weeks or a few uh, rain events, you have an absolutely complete uh, waterproof uh, 
barrier on the outside of your wall. So keeping the water out of the inside of the house, you want to make sure that it drains away from the house. That's having good gutters. You can see with the end of the snow melt here that it's uh, doing pretty well. They should tip to the different directions. There's a downspout on that southern corner of the house and there's a downspout on the northern corner. With a couple of uh, insets here, that probably needs to be another uh, downspout because you can see the water is actually going to build up here. Fortunately, the dripping is on a piece of the uh, pavement, so we're not really worried about it rolling back toward the house or uh, getting in. But uh, right now, this is an inconvenience. If it was any worse than this, then it might be a bit of a problem that would impact us from an indoor air quality case uh, eventually. So now you can see the uh, gutters come over to the downspout, downspout comes down. You always want to make sure that the uh, runoff from the downspout gets far enough away from the house so it's not building up right at the uh, sides where the foundation is, where the water would go down. So in this particular case, there's just one of those little uh, flexible plastic extenders on it and that's going to bring the water far enough away. So that now we don't have to worry about that getting underneath the foundation of the house. So we're inside the same house where we were looking at the uh, faucet outside and we were talking about the bentonite clay that they inject into the ground. Even with that, a good waterproofing to maintain the integrity of the house will involve uh, repair of the cracks in any of the block or in this case the poured cement wall. And this material here is a very um, durable epoxy and you can see it gets painted on to cover the cracks and stuff. It's not the uh, most artistic uh, approach, but the wall had cracked uh, from the upper edge right down to where we have the exit point or the entry point actually for the water coming in for the, um, uh, the main water main coming in. So in addition to the water infiltration, as long as we're here, we want to talk about the wrap that's on the water line here. Uh, depending on the age of the house and the type of the wrap, this could easily be an asbestos-containing material. As it turns out, this one is not, but it's a look-alike material. And uh, you just, unless you know or take a sample, you just don't want to mess with it. In this particular case, you can see the spot that was being bumped or... Um, potentially impacted was wrapped just in some duct tape and that's fine too. Went right down to the uh, water main there. talked about before, uh, anytime there's a foundation leak you want to have some sort of repair on that. This is an epoxy material like you saw on the other wall uh, just to make sure that there's no water infiltration into the house. So many times even if they put the bentonite clay shot into the ground on the outside, you'll want to make sure that the cracks are sealed on the inside. Interestingly, uh, one of the uh, problems that we often run into with indoor air quality is people that aren't venting their dryers properly to the outside. I personally am a big fan of the hard piping uh, going out instead of that flex duct because the flex duct tends to fill up with the lint and everything from the dryer. But you can see here the piping went out. Uh, actually, pretty good job. They've uh, clamped it all together. And uh, that's what you want. You want the hot air with all the moisture from the uh, dryer actually being vented directly to the outside. So another issue that uh, often impacts the indoor air quality in a house is what happens to your sump pump. So water's coming in from the laundry and from other drains uh, that are uh, just outside the, uh, the drains, like the floor drain here goes in. Eventually, when the water level rises up, the sump pump runs and takes it over to the uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, having an open uh, drain uh, just is going to allow a lot more moisture and potential problems into the house. So even if you do a hand-built cover like you see there and cover up the majority of it, uh, that's going to be helpful to you. Uh, this particular case, they had additional pipes and then had to change the uh, so they had to change the uh, sump pump at one point in time, and so 
there's some extra holes and everything, but even just having a basic cover on it so it's not just wide open is uh, going to work for you. You'll often see the plastic covers that you can get at the hardware stores, and that's worth the six or seven dollars that it costs to put them in and then cut around the uh, pipes to put them down to keep a lot of the extra moisture from getting back into the house. So this is a uh, furnace that's been replaced more recently and ended up with a uh, humidifier on it. And what happens is that this humidifier has a gauge here that tells you what level of humidity you want in the house in the wintertime. You really, uh, although if the house is really dry, you could push it up to about 45 here and everything, but really what you want to do is keep this in the uh, 35 to 30 range. You can see it's a little bit high right now. We'll uh, turn that down for the homeowner. But uh, that then allows the water to come through. There's a um, filter pad in there that gets wet. The air gets diverted from the uh, furnace through the uh, humidifier and then that puts a little bit of moisture into the house so everything in the wintertime isn't that bone dry. And that's not good from a health standpoint. Actually, if it's too dry, then uh, bacteria and some of the viruses and stuff in your lungs can uh, grow more readily than if you have a little bit of humidity in the air. This is generally a much better system to put it on the furnace and then to watch it than it is to have the standalone uh, de or humidifiers in the house because those get so... Uh, dirty and, and uh, impacted in regards to the mold and the bacteria and stuff. So pulling off the cover gives you an idea of how the humidifiers work. There's a water line that comes in. This is essentially what's controlled by the humidistat here and tells you uh, how much water to go uh, based on the uh, system actually working. The water drips into this pad, it gets wet, the air comes out through here and uh, pushes in through the um, furnace. So that's how that's going to work and you can see in the summertime when you don't need the humidifier you just turn that little lever and then that shuts that off so that the air doesn't come through here, it doesn't bypass through the humidifier and your summer setting. So on the opposite side of the HVAC system, the furnace and the uh, air conditioner here in this particular house, uh, you can see that this is a more modern uh, system. It doesn't have the big uh, chimney going out. It's just an air intake and an air exhaust through the PVC pipes. Uh, that makes it a much more efficient system, but it also means that you have to be a little bit careful to make sure that these don't get blocked. And in a minute, I'll take you to the outside and I'll show you what that looks like on the outside. From an indoor air quality perspective, it might seem a little silly, but uh, actually understanding what's going on with your water heater makes a big difference in terms of the safety of the people in the house. You want to make sure that the uh, piping is uh, connected all the way through and hasn't been uh, jostled or anything like that. It's sitting firmly on top of the water heater here. Uh, we also recommend to put a pan on the bottom side of the uh, water heater so if there's ever a leak because that's what happens when they give out uh, you don't know they're running fine until they don't and then there's leaking all over the place well that pan catches the water and then there's a hose that takes it around to the nearest floor drain so you don't have a flood necessarily in your house when the uh, water heater gives out which they all do eventually so this is what I was talking about in terms of the uh, pan for the water heater if it ever starts leaking the water goes into the pan then you can see the fitting there comes out runs around into this hose and it takes it over to the floor drain so one of the things that you want to be uh, careful of when you have a water heater that's installed properly is make sure that there's actually a, a gap on the exhaust uh, ducting here and what that allows to do is as the hot air comes out it allows more air to come in and fill the piping and then take it out to the uh, chimney and that's what we're going to show you next. So pretty straightforward, you saw it from the other side with the um, the exhaust for the water heater. Now through here you can see that the piping actually expands a little bit and because it was coming over the cross the top of a occupied area in the house they put an insulated pipe here as compared to just the bare pipe so if somebody was you know picking up the toys or something like that they wouldn't accidentally bump this and burn themselves. 
it then goes into the uh, chimney for the house and then is exhausted to the uh, upper part of the chimney. In a situation like this right here, where a water heater, or in this particular case, originally there was also the um, exhaust for the furnace was coming through here. And oftentimes, if that's the case, you'll see an asbestos paper or some sort of asbestos board that lines the uh, two by fours where it uh, shoots through a wall. And that was the case in this particular house. The homeowner had that. Uh, removed as part of the reinstallation of the uh, new water heater and then uh, years later the new uh, furnace came in as well. So on a high efficiency furnace they don't need to exhaust all the way to the uh, chimney and out they just run the PVC pipes because the temperature is so much lower on the exhaust gases because they're running so much more efficiently and so you'll see a situation like this where two pipes come out through the house one typically bends over and one kind of comes out straight one is an air intake to allow fresh air to get in to the uh, furnace system, and the other is an exhaust. So in the winter time, when the furnace is running, you can tell that this one is the exhaust. You can actually see the a um, little bit more fading on the color on the plastic here and everything, but because that's where the actual hot air is exhausting, and then that one is an intake. Notice these have the little bug catchers on the outside to make sure that you don't get animals and things going in because uh, particularly on the intake side, that's a pretty nice area for a small animal or something to get into uh, from the standpoint it's sheltered and warm. So you don't want to let these get plugged up. It's going to be bad either way. If you can't exhaust, now you're talking about uh, potentially carbon monoxide poisoning in the house. And if you can't get air into it, uh, then you're going to have a furnace that's not going to be running very efficiently, and that can cause problems too, not just a higher gas bill or a propane bill, but also just real uh, problems as well. There's so much that can impact the indoor air quality in your house. And so what we want to take now is just a moment to look at your windows and think about that. Uh, double pane windows are great from an insulation standpoint and an energy efficiency standpoint, but what that also means is that it traps any of the uh, pollutants and gases and things that you might not want in your house. There isn't as much general uh, diffusion out from around the windows and the single pane windows and that sort of stuff. Uh, however, when the windows fail, uh, at least the double pane windows, you tend to see a situation like this, at least in the winter time, where it looks like there's condensation, but there's nothing on this side. And if we went outside, there's nothing on the outside. That means the seal has failed in between the two panes of the window and you're not going to be as efficient and more importantly it's going to impact your view out the window because it will be pretty much at least in the winter time almost a permanent um, condensation like that or a little bit fuzzy look at the world and you know depending on today's world having a fuzzy view of it might not be all that bad. All right, that was a lot of information that Michael gave us all in a very short amount of time. So, and of course I was laughing at the end, so I had a hard time taking the, the video off. Um, <clears throat> we're joined now by Jacob who uh, works with Michael at Wonder Makers. Um, and we're gonna try to answer some questions that came in during the workshop. Um, the first question we have was, let's see if we can show this. Pat Smith, early on, asked what was the anti-mold product that Michael talked about? Are you able to address that one? Yeah, yeah, that's a really easy answer. Uh, it's concrobium mold control. Um, and one of the things that's really nice about it, in addition to being salt-based, so it's relatively less hazardous than some of the other harsher chemicals that people like to use, um, is that it's available at most of the big box stores. So you can pick it up at Menards for sure and any number of other ones. Um, it also has the uh, benefit of not being as harsh. Um, one of the things that you'll often hear sort of as a you know, takeaway from a lot of old wives' tales and folklore is you use bleach to clean mold. Uh, and it's not really that effective it's so quickly neutralized the amount of bleach they can actually put in an over-the-counter solution is just really not enough to deal with the amount of biological material um 
really bleach has to be considered a sanitizer, not a cleaner, which means you have to clean the surface before you use the bleach to sanitize. And when we're trying to deal with mold, we're not looking to sanitize, we're looking to clean. We want to remove what's there. So um, bleach is really too caustic and not a good option, whereas something like concrobium, much more suited for the homeowner to use. All right. Um, our next question was from Kimberly Willis. I've seen multiple types of lead swabs available. Are there any that aren't reliable? Great question. Uh, yeah, it is. Well, there's not always uh, a good way to say these aren't reliable. Um, obviously, they made it to store shelves. Uh, most of them have to work. We prefer the 3M Hybrivet. Um, they were the first to market. Uh, we've had good experience and good history with them. That's what we use. Uh, so that would be what we would continue to recommend. But uh, I won't say that somebody else's product isn't viable. Um, and we had one other comment from Lynn Stevens saying, seals always fail on double pane windows. And um, I think <laughs> double pane windows tend to not last quite as long as single panes because there's fewer parts there. So um, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, you know, it's a great idea. Um, and, you know, one of the concerns that some people might have is, well, you know, they filled that double pane space with gas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when this seal fails, am I at risk from it? And the, the short answer is not typically. They're, they're filling those with an inert gas because they don't want it to react. They want it to really deaden the um, heat transfer. So it's it's nitrogen or argon or something that's not um, not going to react and not really going to be a hazard, but it will leak out and then you lose the efficiency and you can have that condensation issue. Um, in theory, great idea. Someday they'll perfect it. We just haven't got there yet. So it doesn't affect the air quality at all. It's more of a It's more of a visual it's a thing and, I, and I enters efficiency. You know, it it can affect the air quality if it um, condensates to the point where it's leaking back out, right? So all that water that's collecting in there has to go somewhere. And the natural place for it to go is the bottom of that double pane, uh, mm -hmm. at which point it's going to start to create a really rich environment for bacterial or fungal growth, uh, which can eat away at the seal at the bottom and then work its way into the rest of the window. Um, so, you know, all things tend to decay and water's a great accelerator, um, which means that, you know, having water collecting in the bottom of a double pane isn't ideal. There's not always a ton that can be done about it, but, um, you know, you don't want to see it. Okay. Um, Michael mentioned that if you have nine by nine tiles in your, on your floor, in your basement or wherever, um, that that's a sign that you you probably have asbestos. Are all nine by nine tiles asbestos, or is it just kind of assumed? Yeah. So the technical answer is not necessarily. There are <laughs> theoretically nine by nine tiles that are non asbestos containing. We haven't met them yet. <laughs> um, it it is a so common that it's usually safe to assume. Um, you can always sample. Um, Sampling isn't that difficult, and uh, y you know, for something like a tile, it's bound up pretty tightly in there. Um, and unless the asbestos is friable, that's why the the government gave us these categories. Unless it's it's friable and easily disturbed into the air, there is an argument for not wanting to aggressively disturb it because you're just going to create a health hazard, and we don't want anybody doing that. So, uh, our answer for nine by nine tiles is. The safe assumption is to say that it's asbestos and to leave them alone unless they're falling apart on you. Is there is there anything a homeowner can do to make sure that they're not falling apart? Can you coat it with epoxy or paint it or anything like that to keep it together? Or is it is it best at that point when it looks like it's starting to come apart to call in an expert and have it removed? Um, you certainly can do some degree of repair. Uh, Anything that's going to prevent the damage is better. Uh, removal is the best option. Uh, okay. We don't like to, you know, try to put a Band-Aid over a wound that's bleeding. Um, if it's breaking up and they're falling apart and they're coming apart, removing is really the ideal option. Um, if that's not something that can be done, the next step is 
try to prevent the damage, you know, and, and ultimately mm-hmm. that's, that's always going to be our default answer is we don't want to see continuing damage. Uh, you know, if that tile is breaking up because it's on top of a wood floor that's buckling because it's wet, then our primary issue isn't the tile, it's the moisture. So yes, we need to deal with the tile because it's breaking up, but we also need to deal with the moisture more aggressively, more importantly. Um, so I guess the, the first line of defense is prevent the tile from getting damaged. If there's a habit or a pattern that's causing the damage, try to avoid that and beyond that if the tiles damaged to the point where it can't be salvaged in any way you know, remove it okay great um looks like we have one more comment here let's see what we have is it safe to put a wood floor over a linoleum floor hmm that might be beyond what we're able to cover tonight i don't know do you know anything about that jacob yeah um so The safest way to answer that question is to sample the linoleum. Um, Any time that we have what would be considered a potential asbestos-containing material, we need to confirm its asbestos content before we say what we do with it going forward. Um, Unlike the nine by nine tile, you know, there's there's more cases where we've run into where the linoleum isn't asbestos-containing, especially depending on the age. It sometimes is also in the mastic. Um, So that would be a situation where we would recommend sampling uh, before you make any final decision. All right. Um, And I I don't remember if he covered this or not, but if you suspect something having asbestos, where do you get it tested? Um, We offer sample analysis. If you bring one in to us, usually the easiest way to do that is bring it into our office. Um, if you have a readily available sample, otherwise we could talk with you if you want to give us a call about um, what it would take to get an inspector out there. Um, and you know, if you have a question about what it would take to collect that sample, you can certainly call into our office as well, and we'll help you through that process. Okay, great. And I did put uh, your telephone number and your um, web address at the bottom of the screen so that people can reach out to you. Uh, um, you- one note oh, I wanted to follow up on that last comment. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Bringing in a sample, uh, bringing it in a sealed bag. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to expose our our employees either. So, um, okay. you know, if you've got if you've got something that you think might be asbestos, don't uh, wave it around and break it up in front of us to ask us if we can see it. So, okay, <laughs> sounds like a great idea, and probably be real careful putting it in that bag as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Great. So I did put the. I did put your contact information uh, at Wondermakers down at the bottom of the screen. Um, also, people can continue to contact us at Community Homeworks, and we can help answer those questions as well, or we can forward the questions on to you if it's something we can't help with directly. Um, wow, so much information. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jacob. Um, I really appreciate your time and, and the time that you and Michael spent putting the, the video together so much information um, and it will continue to be out there on our website, on our Facebook page and our uh, YouTube channel uh, for foreseeable future. If people want to come back and refer back to it. Um, But I hope we can have you back again uh, when we're in person and, and maybe do this uh, in person instead of doing it remotely. But uh, for now, this is what we're able to do. Um, so thank you very much for, for that. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. We did go a little later than we do most nights, um, but that's okay. It was a great topic. Um, again, Jacob, thank you very much for joining us. Do you have any last minute things you'd like to share before we sign off? Uh, we're pleased to uh, present and help the community, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and Jacob, if you could just stay on the broadcast after we're done here, I'd like to just face with you before we sure i know of course thank you all for joining us have a great evening and stay safe please